All right, everybody, this video is going to be a quick uh, overview of how to do a block average in uh, the nearest toolbox. Uh, it's not as quite straightforward as you would think. Uh, you're actually going to be calling a Homer 2 function in the nearest toolbox, but uh, the toolbox has done a very, very good job of enabling this. And, and not just Homer 2, but there's actually several other toolboxes as well uh, that are available within it. So uh, I'll, I'm going to walk you line by line uh, in this um, uh, script that I wrote, and it's it's going to be a very rough, or very basic uh, pipeline and everything to get a block average out. Uh, we're going to be using a, a finger tapping experiment that I've done. Uh, I don't even know how many times now, uh, but admittedly, I'm not even sure if I was tapping my fingers during the data set, so don't expect the data to be perfect. Uh, mainly, I want you to see we have a data set that has some events. Those events have certain structures, and this is how you would actually call it. So here you'll see I've actually been playing with it quite a bit. I just recently uh, figured out how to do something I couldn't figure out how to do. So we'll cover that at the very, very bottom of this pipeline. Uh, so first step, just to get rid of all this stuff, I'm going to go ahead and clear and close all, and you'll see everything gets off of my screen. I'll also do CLC to clear my command window. The next step, I'm going to call a MATLAB function called UI get directory. Uh, this is just going to give us a nice little pop-up. Uh, the pop-up allows you to choose the data set or the folder uh, of the data set you want to use. We're going to use one data set. We're not going to do a group or anything like that. We're going to keep it fairly simple. Uh, so within this sub two folder, I happen to know I have a, a nice finger tapping data set in there. So I'm going to go ahead and click select. Um, you'll see the, the root directory appear here. The next step is to use a nearest toolbox function. And at this point, I've already added nearest toolbox as a, to my file path. I've also added Homer 2 to my file path. You will need, and it's specifically the source code for Homer 2, which is available in the normal download site for Homer 2. Um, yeah, you'll need both in order to actually call these functions. So I'm going to use the load directory function, which is in the nearest folder and the IO subfolder. I'm going to use the root directory that I just selected. This is a little redundant, but it's basically saying it's a folder hierarchy. And it's saying if I open the first folder I see, it's going to be called group. The next folder within that, I'm going to call subject. I only have one, uh, one folder, so there, it's not going to really matter here. Uh, I then have to designate which function, which sub function I'm going to load the data in with. I'm going to use load near x2, and I'm going to look for a WL1 uh, file type or file extension. So I'll go ahead and evaluate. Uh, this takes a little bit here. Uh, of course, if you have other types of data, not a NIREX data set, you can use other um, func load functions. Uh, so here, my raw data has been prepared. So I've loaded it in. The one thing I do want you to notice is I have 2,000 time points, a little over that, and 40 columns. The 40 columns, the time points are just data time points, times when data, data was collected. Uh, the 40 columns, however, are 20 channels times two because I have two wavelengths of data. So there are two wavelengths, wavelength one, wavelength two, and they paste them together like that. So I can go ahead and close that. And then I start my pipeline. So I'm going to go to the nearest folder, the module subfolder. And I'm going to convert my raw data to optical density. I put nothing as the input because it's my first step. I save it as J, which will be my output of this step. And then I put it as the input for the next one, which is the Beer-Lambert law. Beer-Lambert law is going to take uh, voltage, uh, so change in intensity, in our case, relative changes in intensity, and convert it to concentrations of some molecule. Again, more than likely you're looking at hemoglobin in the brain and you use a lot of inputs for the, for the Beer-Lambert law or assumptions put into the Beer-Lambert law to do that. So now I have J, it's the Beer-Lambert law. It's moved from optical density now down one. At this point, I like running my data uh, or running my pipeline, excuse me, and outputting the hemoglobin. And I'll show you why in just a second. So you can take the raw data and you can do raw.draw. I do that, and you get this lovely pop-up. You have the voltages uh, from about 0 to 1, each channel times two wavelengths. Then you have the stimuli, so when the events were actually occurring. Very nice. You'll see they're called channel 1, channel 15. Not They're actually left and right finger tapping, but, but they default to uh, whatever trigger value is sent. So you close that, and then now I can do hb.draw, and now I can get see the change. So at this point, I can see it went from voltage to relative changes in, in, in uh, hemoglobin. And then you still have these uh, tr trigger points, trigger values. Okay, 
So now we'll get to the Run Homer 2 module. So you go to the nearest folder, the mo uh, modules subfolder, and you go Run Homer 2 is the uh, actual function. So I'll evaluate. You'll notice it's empty. I'm, I'm starting a new pipeline here. I've already used up the other pipeline. You can keep it going if you wanted to, it, but, but we don't need to at this point. So, okay, I've created it. So I open it up and you see I have an FCN, which is empty. That stands for function. It means which function, which Homer 2 function do you want to run? And then VARS stands for variables and it's, it's empty. The VARS is actually dependent on the function that you're going to use. So it's the input variables. So I'm going to designate Homer block average. This does have to be spelled right and capitalized correctly in order to call it correctly. So I'll go ahead and evaluate it. And you'll notice when I open this up, it now says Homer block average. And now my variables have something. It's called T range and it's empty. T range is what is the time range that you're going to do these blocks on. So I'm going to designate two variables, T pre and T post. That means time pre stimulus and type time post stimulus. Uh, I'm going to evaluate it. And now I have a nice little array here, or two, excuse me, two variables with, with time points. I'm going to put it into that empty variable, J dot vars, vars, uh, dot t range, and I make an array using those. So I go back in, go to my variables, go to t range. There it is, negative five and twenty. It's exactly what I wanted. So what my block is going to look at is time points negative five to twenty. You will possibly want to change that, but that's some fairly reasonable values. I'm going to go ahead and run it, and it gives me, and I save it as blk for block. You can save it as whatever you like. And now we have our actual data. So our block average is here. So now within the data, not much has changed overall, but you'll see it no longer do I have 2,000 time points, but I have 196, so about 200. That's uh, 5 plus 20, because I have 5 seconds prior, 20 seconds after, it's 25 seconds in total, multiplied by the sampling rate. I have 40 channels, 40 columns, excuse me, which is still 20 channels times 2, because now I have oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. Oxy, deoxy, pasted together, concatenated together. Then I have this third dimension. The third dimension is my conditions. I have condition one, condition two, or one in 15, if you recall. It was left and right finger tapping. If you have more than two conditions, you'll have more than two as this third dimension. So you have a couple ways now that you can show this. So if I just want to pull up all block averages, I can do block.draw. Here, all my block averages. Great. That's a lot, though. Not very interesting. So I want to get a little bit more specific. Well, I have two ways to do this. One's going to be the long-winded way, which is here. It's a couple for loops. You could clean that up if you wanted. I wanted to make it very obvious as to what's going on. Or what we have at the bottom. So let's go through this. So first things first, I want to figure out how many channels I have. Well, I'm going to take the whole second dimension of the data set. And I'm going to divide it by two because I happen to know it's oxy and deoxy. So it's two dimensions on that. Well, look, channels now is 20. I had 20 channels. And I happen to know I did have 20 channels. Now I actually want to separate my conditions out. Uh, so I'm going to have condition one, which was the first third dimension. And I'll go ahead and run that. There we go. And now I have a 196 by 40 data set. So one single matrix rather than a, a two-dimensional matrix rather than a three-dimensional matrix. And for condition two, I'm going to do the same thing, but for the second, third dimension. So now I want to print out all of the first condition. So I run a for loop through all the channels and I plot the conditions. Well, look at that. There they are. Lovely. They don't really look all that great, but I have my blocks. Everything is well and good. So Next, I want to plot the second condition. So now I just change condition one, which was up here as condition one, to condition two. And I do the same for loop, and I pl plot it. So you can do it this way. It's pretty straightforward. There we go. All well and good. A couple motion artifacts going on at the end on these. Um, great. We have our, our blocks. All's amazing, well and good, wonderful. But there's an even easier way to do this. So now I can actually just do block draw and I can select the channel. So if I do block draw one, I can evaluate the selection. There it is, block draw one. Uh, but I, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I want block draw one and 21, which is actually the paired values here. And I actually need to do one thing. I need to put it into a, an array there. 
There we go. There they are. So now you can actually just plot the pairs knowing that you have 20 channels in between the oxy and deoxy. So you need to advance that, which is actually what was done here in the plot, if you recall. So here we had I, which was the channel number, plus whatever channel it was. So it was plotting both the channel and then 20 past the channel, which would have been the, the matching deoxyhemoglobin. But but the question is, how do I get that? So that's condition one, great, but how do I get condition two? I can't just do a third dimension, it doesn't work uh, in the toolbox. But what's pretty neat is, well, I can actually do channel 41 and channel, would it be 61? Let's see if that works. There we go, there it is. So now the third dimension is in a way concatenated onto those 40 channels. You go from channel one through 40 being of, you know, condition one, and then channels 41 through 80 being condition two. So at that point, you could run a for loop on that, similar to how we did here, or you can just select uh, the, the channels that you want uh, one by one. So let's say I wanted two and 22. Whoop, let's back that up and run that yeah, come on boom there we go and you can see the the matching the coinciding motion artifact there and the not so exciting uh data set that actually occurred on that but this is this is how you would run a, a block average through this personally uh for the sake of the video i think this for these for loops are very useful you can pause the screen, read through the code, and see if it makes sense. Nothing very complex on there. You select condition one because you know it's the first third dimension, condition two because you know it's the second third dimension. You figure out how many channels you have, and you pair off the oxy and deoxy based on the separation of the channel count. However, this is really easy. You just do your block average dot draw, and you select the channels you want. And again, you can do the block average, or excuse me, the for loops uh, using the channel separation to, to pair off the oxy and deoxy. Anyway, I do hope that was helpful. Uh, I'll have a few more on, on, on these, and I'm digging into a bit more of the complex functions as well, and potentially a couple other softwares as well on, on new videos. Uh, I've encouraged several people that if, if you come across a function you want to use, or you're not sure what it does, please uh, send a comment on YouTube or you can email me. I think I have my personal email on there as well. I work on these on the weekends and I am I do a very, very slow turnaround. So don't expect it to happen uh, immediately, but I will work on it. Uh, so if you find something of interest, please let me know and I'll work to get a video on this. Anyway, I do hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, uh, put a comment or, or email me and I'll work to, to answer that for you. Thank you very much.